Welcome back to Worldview. Now, in the 1970s, young Buddhist monks in saffron robes would walk down the middle of the street in what was then North or South Vietnam, douse themselves in kerosene, then kneel in prayer while setting themselves alight. The Vietnam War would end a few short years later. In Tunisia, a fruit vendor by the name of Mohammed Bouazizi set himself ablaze after a local police officer took his vegetable cart and a woman police officer mocked him in front of everybody. Now, he died of his burns several days later, and his martyrdom led to an uprising a few short weeks later that started what we all know as the Arab Spring. It would topple the government of Ben Ali. Well, a group of young Tibetan monks, some as young as 15 years of age, find themselves in such desperate straits, to date some 17 of them have set themselves ablaze, trying to raise the plight of the Tibetan people to the broader world. It's called self-immolation, and it influenced a group of students and former students half a planet away to make this stop action video. Now, these students took it upon themselves to put this video together. Joining me here in the studio are Flor from the Netherlands, Siring from Washington, D.C. and uh, Hawaii, and Koso from Nigeria and Germany. Now, um, your father is very active um, in the Tibet cause, and uh, how has that affected you? Well, my father, he's a uh, pension on his caster for Voice of America for the Tibetan service. And what he does is he basically reports on news that comes back from Tibet or Dharamsala. And when he does that, the Chinese government, they pick up on that naturally. So it's really difficult for my family to get visas to Tibet. And it's also difficult for his family inside China to get other job promotions and things like that. So what's the motivation behind making this particular tape? It's just raising awareness about Tibet. Because there's so little news coverage of issues inside Tibet that even such a thing as self-immolation is not picked up on. Like, this is just a ridiculous concept that people should know about, but, like, they know nothing about it. So we figure we need to do something. The Dalai Lama had to leave Tibet many, many years ago, and Tibet has been through a number of changes internally since they've been under Chinese, total Chinese control. Um, indeed, one of the, I think it's the higher deities but somewhat lower than the Dalai Lama, was hand-selected by the Chinese yeah. government. The Pension Lama. The Pension Lama. Talk a little bit about how that worked. Well, um, it's pretty strange because in the beginning, the Qing Dynasty, yeah. uh, they put in this golden urn, and they said, you should put in the names of the potential Dalai Lamas into this urn and pick them out by a lottery. So the Tibetans were like, okay, whatever. So they did that. But then years, like literally a century afterward, the Chinese were like, oh, so this is how you should do it again. So they did it again, but then they put in one man's name, and he was hand-selected by China. However, the Dalai Lama himself, he said that only the pension lama can be picked by the Dalai Lama. So he picked his own Dalai Lama, but the Chinese government, they disappeared him, basically. So the Chinese selected pension lama. He's the one who's in charge of like the religious affairs of Tibet now. So what does this mean for the future of Tibet? Well, it means that it's not going to be the same Tibetan Buddhism that it once was if China has its way. But 
when I was in Tibet over the summer, um, I saw that a lot of people, they didn't really listen to what the Chinese were telling them, or the Chinese government was telling them about uh, religious and like what they should do and what they should not do. Most of them don't believe that the Chinese elected pension lama is a real pension lama, and they still follow the Dalai Lama. Now, the, the one thing that stood out from the video was the, the, the ages of some of these young people who have self-immolated. Yeah. Uh, that they were some, some were as young as 15. Um, why are we losing so much treasure, basically, to something like this? Well, there was once, one of the self-immolations was a girl in middle school, and her statement before she self-immolated was that uh, when she was in school, she wasn't allowed to learn Tibetan. She couldn't speak Tibetan. She couldn't learn about her, her country's culture. And she, was, she felt so humiliated and so angered by that. She thought it would be better to die than live under such um, censorship. So it's because they want to bring back a better Tibet with human rights for all, and they'd rather die for that cause. Now, Siring, um, my understanding is that you've got some personal family experience with self-immolation. Tell us a little bit about what's going on. My uncle, Hamon Satan, he self-immolated on October 26, 2012. And he left behind my aunt and a two-year-old daughter. So that was about a year ago by now. And what did he leave behind as a, as, as a reason for doing this? Is it the same as what we talked about before, or is it something different? Yeah, um, it was along the lines of how he was protesting the unchanging Chinese policy on Tibet since the 1950s, and also lack of human rights in his region. So to lose a family member like that, that had to have been very powerful. Um, what, um, what impact did that have on your family in, in the States? We learned about it a week after he was self-immolated, because it's really hard to get information out of Tibet, especially regarding such sensitive information. Um, my mother was devastated. My father was also equally hurt. I, I didn't know him that well, but it's still, because I've never visited Tibet before, and you know, but it still hurt a lot to know that someone from my own family like, chose to burn himself alive to protest these things that I fought for before as well, but like in America, where I actually had an avenue you know, to protest for that. So it was just really grossly unjust. So Searing, um, you, you, you're doing this to raise awareness of, of, of uh, what's going on. What's, what's the next step in the process? Well, um, it's been said that the first step towards justice is to pay attention. Um, so I think that the self immolations are caused by two main things. It's the Chinese policy on Tibet and also the lack of human rights inside Tibet. So after you learn about the self immolations and you raise awareness about it, um, the next step, I think, well, one of many, would be to either help, um, volunteer for, intern for, or fundraise for organizations like International Campaign for Tibet or Students for Free Tibet that fight to change Chinese policy in Tibet and also to help Tibetans currently in Tibet and in exile. And also um, to write letters to representatives in the government to have them put some pressure on China to change their policy on Tibet. What is it about, um, how desperate does the situation have to be for someone to actually consider that course in your mind? Very, very desperate. Cause it's, it's really extreme to be, because there's so many protests that you could, you've seen around the world and to put yourself on fire, that must be really extreme to have to go through dowsing, you're drinking lots of petrol, and then ma lighting a flame, a match, and then putting yourself on fire. Do you understand that whole process and why <laughs> somebody would actually do it? I just recently learned what self immolation was about, yeah. so it still comes as a shock, and I don't fully understand why they would still do it yet, but I do get that it has to do a lot with the desperation of not being heard by people, so a lot of times the media takes in the most extreme things. So setting themselves on fire is a very extreme thing, something that people would learn about and want to read why they would do that. Now, one of the interesting parts of this is the, the use of body art and stop action filming. What was it that motivated you there? Because you said you were very interested in the art. So I came up with the idea originally and then I kind of took it on as well, and I, 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 love, I love taking facts, so scientific stuff, and, well not scientific, but like fact stuff and putting it with the more creative side, that's why I like architecture kind of thing, um, and so it was quite interesting to be able to use 
the art body arts and which actually does link in with setting yourself on fire because of the whole you know flames in your body being used as a form of protest so it was actually a good idea to use your body to set out a message which is exactly what they were doing as well thanks for joining us Kosa. you have been described as the uh inspiration behind this video. Talk a little bit about it as an art project. I never heard about self-immolation before Siren told me. And um, when I heard this, I was shocked because it's such an, yeah, I can't even describe it. Like I never heard of it and it really made a big impression on me. And um, then we were thinking about how, because I'm really into art, uh, how I or how we could use our creativity to uh, raise awareness. So how did you um, meet Searing and, and become interested in these, this, the self-immolation? We had a social justice conference at our school and we um, had to give a presentation with our house about a topic that has something to do with the social justice, social injustice. Um, and then we were talking about different topics and then Siren came up with self-immolation in Tibet. And um, I never heard of it before. A lot of people in our house never heard of it. But we were all really, um, yeah, like we, from the moment she uh, told us about self-immolation in Tibet, we all knew that uh, this would have been a good topic. Um, now, the question I have to ask is, how can three people making a film on YouTube make a difference in the world? It's hard to... It's really hard to raise awareness only by talking to people, because if you talk to people and you're talking about a topic, you won't know... You, you, will, you can ask them to tell other people, but that won't... like. I think it, we wanted to make something emotional so that it would really, and like we used the facts to like make people aware of what was happening. Like if I tell someone, if I tell a story about this topic to someone, he might remember like a few facts, but not everything. And um, I think the video, yeah. Well, we, we used a lot of social media, we shared it on Facebook, and so we did, yeah, the best we could. Music plays such a huge role in that film. It's only a little under two minutes in length, but uh, there's a haunting piano melody that plays underneath it. Where does that come from? A boy from our house, we were not sure about the music because we were, um, we wanted to you make it an, emo an emotional video but not yeah well it's it's really hard to find the right music find the right mu uh, music because yeah it was really hard but then a boy from our house um, came up with this music and we we were like okay we could try it and actually from the moment we tried it it fit perfectly and yeah it's such a very sad topic. It's not unlike what people went through for religious freedom in this part of the world when the Crusades came through. Religious freedom is trampled all across Tibet, yet internal debate is decidedly mixed as the native Chinese feel Tibet is their nation, whereas those who remember the past hold a much different view. One thing we can all agree on, far too much treasure is being lost. Let's make sure it's not in vain. If you click the link that's appearing below me right now, it'll take you to the video that was produced by these students. Please watch it. Please share it across your social networks. You're watching Worldview with Dennis Campbell. We'll be right back.